All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Visit El Paso plans on providing more um, webinars um, that'll help keep our community and our industry informed. Um, and we're kicking it off with uh, Dr. Christina Mena. Um, and I'm going to give her a little bit of time to talk about herself, but she's our, our guest today talking about hotels and hospitality and the best protection practices um, during a pandemic. And I know we can all use the additional information. Um, uh, but you can also join us uh, next Thursday on the 10th at 10 a.m. as well. We'll be hosting another town hall uh, and go through some of the things that we've learned on national and other state um, webinars. Um, and um, the following weekend, I believe that's the uh, week, the 17th, we will have um, the director of tourism for the state of Chihuahua and he'll be joining us then. So be on the lookout in your email for more information on the, the subsequent webinars. Um, but as of right now, uh, Dr. Mena, yours is the floor. Hey, thank you. And I welcome questions, but would it be easier and more streamlined at the end? Yeah, I think so, and I'll I will, if there's okay. something that pertains, I'll try to get your attention. Okay, in. sure, yes, yeah. so I see you, and I, I don't see the, the chat box, so yeah, thank you for doing that. So thank you for having me, um, really appreciate it. I, I am with UT Houston School of Public Health. I'm the Dean of the El Paso campus, and so those of you who don't know, um, UT Houston has six campuses of School of Public Health throughout the state of Texas. The El Paso campus has been here since 1992, and I've been here since 2001. And I, I was hired for UT Houston for the El Paso campus. So I've never lived in Houston or obviously we, we function as one school and I go to Houston for meetings now virtually, which we have always done a lot of virtual meetings. Um, but I, I do consider El Paso home. I, I'm from Indiana originally, but I've lived now in El Paso longer than any other place I've lived. So um, I just, I love El Paso. I love this community. But I did want you to know a little bit about about UT Houston and our connection to the medical center and the resources we have. And one of the reasons why we have the campuses in different parts of Texas is to bring, whether it's educational resources for students, they could earn a degree from the largest medical center in the world and never have to leave El Paso, or it's research infrastructure or other types of, of resources, whether it's economical um, or you know infrastructure. So again, thank you for having me. Um, in addressing this pandemic, I do feel like my, my career has somewhat come full circle. I'm a, an environmental microbiologist by training, and my dissertation in the 1990s was how to mitigate the transmission of viruses in your community, believe it or not. And it focused on, on waterborne viruses in particular, but the epidemiological mechanisms and looking at the spread of viruses throughout a community, some of those principles are the same. And there's lots of different factors to consider when we talk about viruses and how they circulate and how they impact the health of people living in communities and towns. And so I'm briefly going to talk a little bit about that, but really focus on different hospitality sectors, including hotels, and maybe ways we can um, mitigate the risk of infection within our region. So when we think about um, viruses in our community and you know we we've all seen on the news the cruise ship virus right norovirus the virus that causes daycare diarrhea rotavirus but when we think about doing something fun and a recreational activity and going on excursions on cruise ships you know it's been in the news for years the the problems that we've had with norovirus for example but people still went on cruises right I mean the focus of norovirus on cruise ships has been about getting rid of norovirus on cruise ships, not about removing people and stopping cruises. People still booked cruises. And a lot of that is the difference um, between this particular virus and norovirus. I mean, norovirus, um, it is very difficult to sanitize an environment. Noroviruses, like the novel coronavirus, um, does survive for very long periods of time on inanimate surfaces. Um, nor it can be difficult to clean when you're sick with norovirus. It not only can be transmitted through the fecal oral route, but it also viral particles are in projectile vomiting, which is really why it makes getting um, cruise ships sanitized very important. So what I'd like to end, emphasize here about this coronavirus and really emphasize the word novel. So novel meaning new. There's a lot we don't know about it, 
because it's a new type of coronavirus. There's several human coronaviruses, four that are more associated with the common cold. But there are some things we know about this coronavirus that makes it different. And these are the three basic um, associated issues that you probably have already know about, you've experienced, or really they're highlighted in, in mainstream media now. One is so easily transmitted person to person. So it's a little bit more than norovirus, for example, even though we know norovirus is easily transmitted from person to person. But this one in particular um, can survive in aerosolized particles. And we know about social distancing, you know, that term very well. It has this potential severity of health outcomes. That's a little bit different than some of the other environmentally transmitted viruses. And there's also this mysterious unknown factor, right, that we've seen um, in a couple of you know, recent weeks regarding children and other associated health outcomes. And it's a little unclear the full clinical mechanisms of this virus. And then finally, which is true of other viruses, but it's really important here, is the role of the asymptomatic. The person who is infected doesn't know it because they're not showing symptoms and then unintentionally is transmitting the virus to other people. So we know in other outbreak situations, whether it's a foodborne or waterborne outbreak, there can be asymptomatic cases as high as 30%, a third of the population. Here, some communities that have collected data to the best of their ability have reported anywhere from 30 to 50%. And when we do risk assessments of viruses as they transmit through communities, we usually assume a, a worst case 50% scenario. What's really important about the novel coronavirus is that because it's so easily transmitted from person to person, that secondary transmission from someone who's not showing symptoms can really wreak havoc on a community, within a workplace, within an, at an event. So it's really important to keep these you know, three aspects in mind when we address the novel coronavirus. So here are some points to consider when we're talking about coronavirus and reopening Texas, reopening our community. And I like, you know, we summarize with three basic um, concepts when we think about reopening businesses, including hotels and other events and attractions. First and foremost, if one can work remotely, they should. So if you have employees who can effectively work from home, continue to do so during this time, even though we're reopening Texas. Um, it's just very important to just keep uh, people apart as much as possible. I understand it's also important to, for the economy to get back to work, but really think about who can still work at home. Um, the level of human interaction, and this is what I think is really going to drive the workplace safeguards for different businesses. Uh, a lot of what we've seen, there's so many documents produced nationwide, statewide, citywide, throughout the United States regarding workplace safeguards, and I'll have a list of some resources at the end of this PowerPoint that will be made available to all of you. And I'm sure you've already seen all of these, and many of the hotels already have their own. But when you look at these workplace safeguards, a lot of time they're structured by industry. So restaurants, retail, hotel, gyms, et cetera. And I think it really should be maybe more at a different level and look at human interaction. And some businesses within the same industry may have different types of human interactions. And I think that should drive some of the specific workplace safeguards that could be developed and implemented. So we'll talk about that. And then the ability to modify your workplace in order to have those workplace safeguards. And some businesses will be more apt to be able to do that than others. Do you, are you trying to, you know, as I cannot see you, so just interrupt me. Okay. Sounds good. Is, is this good? Yep, looks great. Okay, then I'll just keep going. I don't see any, I have my full screen. So, okay, thank you. So when we talk about um, modifying the workplace and in ways that we can minimize transmission of a novel coronavirus, it's really all about mitigating exposure. So we know the virus is here. We know we wanna get back to work. We know that if there's any exposure at all, any potential exposure, then there's potential risk. No exposure, there's no risk. So we just really need to think about the fact that this particular virus transmits so easily from person to person. So a lot of those workplace safeguards, as you, as you have seen, has been about minimizing human interaction to minimize exposure. So this should really be the underlying principle as we talk about hotels and, and different types of strategies uh, to, you know, to open safely, if you will, or as safe as possible 
during the pandemic. And so when we think about the hotel setting, which is very unique and something that's obvious, but I had not thought about trying to talk to probably some of you on this call about a month or so ago. And I realized, oh, that's right. Hotels are, you know, many, M-I-N-I, -I -I, many businesses in one. And so it's, you know, there's a restaurant, a, a, a kitchen area, some are bigger than others. Um, there's gyms, there's pools besides the, the lodging and also the common areas. There might be a common computer area and, and other areas where people can lounge in the hotel lobby. So there's lots of ways in a hotel in particular for people to interact. The three overarching aspects that we have, you know, constantly been, been told, right, are social distancing, maintain at least six feet apart, wear a face covering, and with that, the aspect I, I want to really emphasize and that I think most of us understand, but there's still some misperceptions about the purpose of the face covering is that we're not talking about what I often hear termed as PPE or personal protective equipment. PPE is something that one does to protect themselves. So when I talk about or anyone talks about face coverings in the healthcare setting, they are talking about PPE and there's different forms of that. And that would be for a different, obviously, you know, business slash healthcare sector. For all of us, everyone else, including our customers and the general population, face coverings are meant just that, to cover our face and really to provide a better protection for everyone around us. And so that, that's very different. We know that PPE can be hard to come by and we really want our frontliners and our healthcare providers to have access to those. And that would be a different talk and a different you know, way we think about accessing those. For face coverings, we're talking about either, you know, probably cloth masks, for example. And again, it's worn because that can provide a barrier in terms of preventing aerosolized droplets um, from maybe reaching another person. There was a study that I will say that came out last week that looked at how those face coverings, cloth masks that we're all wearing can um, prevent transmission. And as one might obviously conclude, it is better protection from when someone's in front of you and you're wearing the face covering versus when someone's behind you because we know that they don't often, you know, they're not a good seal. You're not, you're, your face isn't fitted to the, or the mask isn't fitted to your face as they are in the healthcare setting. And so it's not 100% proof, but it is a, a barrier that can help minimize exposure. And then finally, hand hygiene, you know, pro, you know hand washing and doing what we can to not transmit this virus to environmental surfaces and to each other. So this is a busy slide, but I, most of you, if not all of you know about the types of environmental controls from an industrial hygiene perspective that any business could employ and modify to their workplace setting. And so these are the, the, the basic components from elimination down to PPE. So a couple of things I wanted to emphasize, um, Regarding PPE, again, this is what we hear a lot about in the media, and it is very important, and El Paso has a very strong effort to replenish and allocate personal protection equipment. And this is through the Medical Center of the Americas Foundation leadership and our Paso Del Norte Health Foundation, doing a lot in this regard. But that's really the least effective. But we know that it's so important because of the novel coronavirus and how it's transmitted. When we think about workplace settings, however, we can consider things like elimination, which that just goes back to if people can work from home, because they may be asymptomatic, they probably need to just work at home during this time as our, as our nation transitions through this pandemic. And there should be an employee self-screening. Don't come to work if you're ill. Now that, that type of health screening does begin at home. Obviously, if you have a fever and other symptoms, stay at home. The two in the middle, just to, to discuss briefly, um, engineering controls and administrative controls. So these would be very different depending upon the type of attraction or event or workplace that we're talking about. So an engineering control might be something like those plexiglass um, barriers that we see now at grocery stores that provide a barrier between the cashier and the customer. Um, the way they have the um, stickers, if you will, noting the six feet distance as people are standing in line, you know, through aisles, um, that type of engineering design. Administrative controls are something that we should all be thinking about now in terms of 
how are people going to work? How are they, how are we going to shift workers? Are we going to stagger shifts? Are we going to cross train? Um, one of the biggest I think, recommendations that's an overarching recommendation for lots of different types of workplaces that have office settings is thinking about who's working when and where and have them work in what they're calling work pods. And that way, if someone in that pod suddenly either becomes ill, shows symptoms, tests positive for coronavirus, maybe there's a household contact that's discovered who has coronavirus, is there a way then that entire pod can then work from home for the next 14 days? And does that workplace, those, do those managers have people who were not working that shift, who are cross-trained and can seamlessly come in and take over so the business is not disrupted? So those are the types of things to be thinking about. Three other areas that I call potential drivers of infection risk that isn't always at the forefront of those is one is the role of environmental um, surfaces. So the, these other sources of contamination, I know that hotels, there's already a lot of guidelines out there for how they already, you, know, you all already practice um, you know, excellent disinfection practices. So now it's just thinking about maybe this in a way we hadn't thought about before with that role of an asymptomatic person who may be compromising an environment. And maybe it's also about increasing the frequency of disinfection. The role of improper implementation of controls, um, maybe it's the use of disinfectants. You know, certain disinfectants require certain contact times on surfaces, and that's based on the type of disinfectant. And that can usually be found on the bottle or on the EPA website, or if it's Lysol or Clorox, they'll have that information online as well. I'm thinking about the proper use of masks, as I mentioned to the face coverings. And then finally, the role of the customer or patron. I, I haven't seen a whole lot of that aspect in some of the workplace safeguards I've seen printed by CDC and WHO and other um, you know, sources of information. A lot's about the employer and the employees. But if we think about how a customer who either is not aware of those guidelines or doesn't choose to follow those guidelines, could really disrupt a workplace setting. So I think that's something that needs to be considered as we reopen Texas. So a few overarching factors just to think about, and these are part of lots of discussions within the El Paso community. As you probably know, city county has a COVID-19 task force. I mentioned the Medical Center of the Americas Foundation and the Paso Del Norte Health Foundation brought in Battelle. It's a health research group out of the Midwest. You know, everyone's talking about what approach should we take? And, and I, I think it should be a multifaceted approach. There's not a one size fits all. Um, but as, as we've all entered other businesses, as Texas is reopening, some of us have experienced these um, health screening that, again, I mentioned should begin at home. But if employees come to work, you know, some, some employers are taking temperatures as they come in as an initial health screening, um, checking for symptoms, the Texas Medical Center. In the clinical setting is doing that, not in the academic setting. Testing is a hot topic. That could be a whole other webinar um, just about back to work, a return to work strategy for testing. That's really tricky right now with the tools we have available. Um, does one test everybody as they come back to work? Are we testing for the antibody? Are we testing for the virus? We know that someone could test for the virus um, today and be negative get exposed and then truly be a positive tomorrow or the next day? Do we have the resources to test everyone? We know that it's such a dynamic process when we consider transmission. So that's, that's a difficult question. It might then be better to assume that we're all infected. We're all asymptomatic. Let's proceed as such. Let's work from home if we can. And if not, then we're going to go to work. We're going to act accordingly as if we are infected and we're not going to compromise people around us or the environment. So I mentioned, really think about who, when, and where people are working within the workplace. This is gonna be critical. And there's, there's a debate right now regarding if someone becomes ill at your work environment and they're sent home, when should they be able to come back? Who then should come home, you know, be sent home because they were exposed? And then who should do the contact tracing? And that's when that's investigative procedure starts that we have volunteers nationwide working with health departments on this, where phone calls and interviews are made to find out who was in contact with that person. 
a lot of employers don't think it should be their responsibility. What might make it easier though, and I'm sure workplaces already have schedules and, and, and shifts written down and who is in, when, and where, where they were located, front desk at a hotel, for example, or in the back room. But that would, it's gonna be critical to have access to that information. Should someone test positive, then it could be quite easy, quote unquote, if you will, for that workplace setting to go back and see who was in contact with that person. And then you know, as, as, as minimally as you can, without disrupting your business operation, everybody who was exposed should probably go home for at least 14 days. And then if you shifted things correctly, or has some you know, thought about it, hopefully there's people who were not there that day who are cross-trained and your business can continue seamlessly. So we'd also need to consider household contacts. That's something that's not talked a whole lot about in the published literature or in the media. I mean, uh, anecdotally, in some of the data I've seen, most people, not all, but in many cases, when someone has tested positive for the novel coronavirus and they test all the household contacts immediately, they're typically negative. And then when they test them seven to 14 days later, they ultimately become positive. There's not a whole lot out there on how to mitigate that risk within households, but there have been studies from other outbreaks that have talked about what is the effectiveness of wearing masks in a household when you're already that close to somebody <laughs> in terms of minimizing exposure and minimizing infection risk. So we know the household contacts are gonna be key. And as I mentioned already, consider the impact of the customer. So now for the next few slides, and I'll kind of speed up here, I'm just gonna highlight some different workplace settings a lot of this has already been available in guidelines, but I try to also think about maybe some other things to think about, either what's been shared with me from the hotel industry or things I've learned, or even thinking more about my experience as a customer. But I've already mentioned staggering work shifts and cross-training employees. Um, one scenario, and this, this hasn't been emphasized as much when we're getting guidelines nationwide, but it is something to think about, about Considering wearing face coverings, even if you're working alone, it might depend on the job, probably depends upon, you know, how many, the chance of interacting with people. Maybe it's not that much if you work the night shift at the front desk. Maybe you're on the phone more. I'm not sure. So you guys, we can talk about this at the end because I, you know, I'm not in, in that field. But there have been studies of other respiratory viruses in office settings and in settings such as that where someone was working, they were asymptomatic. Again, a respiratory virus, they talk on the phone, they answer the phone, they're on their cell phone, they're writing using papers, and they did compromise their environment. And because that person worked alone, they weren't showing symptoms, maybe that front desk wasn't disinfected more frequently than it normally would have been. And now you have an area where the next morning customers come in, more people come into work, and they are potentially then exposed to novel coronavirus. So there's a lot of what ifs in that scenario, but there have been studies in the peer reviewed literature that have showed how easily respiratory viruses can be transmitted from a person to a surface, maybe to a cell phone that then's put down on a surface and then transmitted to someone else. So it is possible. So it's just something to think about. And it's not just about keeping people away from each other. We need to think about the person who may be asymptomatic and working by themselves, but in a public area. Increasing the frequency of environmental service disinfection, I'll talk about more of that in a second. And then consider ventilation. The overarching recommendation for establishments, such as restaurants, hotel lobbies, whatever this could be done, is to have a four to six, um, or have a exchange the air in the room four to six times a day. And there's ways to do that through the HVAC system. I'm not going to be able to explain it, but there is a recommendation for many office buildings to work with the HVAC specialists on how to do that. Don't turn on fans and recirculate the air, but definitely have a air exchange um, four to six times a day. And that, that's what's deemed to be very helpful in terms of um, trying to mitigate virus exposure. So this is already taking place in hotels. I have to mention this. I don't know if some of you have ever heard of uh, Dr. Chuck Gerba. He was my advisor in the 90s. He's known as Dr. Germs. He was the first person to do kind of the silly studies who looked at coffee cups in the workplace, the remote control in hotel rooms, 
looking for different types of disease causing organisms. So I got to experience all that when I was a student back then. But as you all know, disinfecting services is very important. I have a resource at the end of the PowerPoint and there's what's called now the list in disinfectants for use against the novel coronavirus. And as I mentioned before, it's important to look at contact times and proper use of those. Um, I've already mentioned be mindful about where you set things. Let's, let's assume that we're asymptomatic carriers of the novel coronavirus. Um, things that many hotels already do and other establishments. Think about electronic signatures by guests. Perhaps provide pens. I've had a company tell me that when, the, when they knew they were going to reopen, it was a mortgage company, they, they order pens with their logo on it and everyone gets a pen. When they come to sign something, everyone gets a pen and they take their, their pen home. And then think about you know, contactless payment. And that's also the case for restaurants and other establishments. As I mentioned hotels have multiple settings. So for hotel gyms, for example, you might wanna think about single use scheduling. Um, maybe that's better controlled in a hotel setting, I'm not sure, than in, a, in another type of gym that's a standalone gym. Think about those best disinfection practices. We'll talk about that again in a second. Limit the number of guests in the pool area. I'll talk about water in a moment, but when we know pools, the greatest risk comes from not being able to maintain social distancing. So that's where the greatest risk of infection comes from in pools. And then for food safety protocols, um, those should be implemented as I'm sure they all always are. And in reality, if, if a restaurant or kitchen implements food safety that will combat norovirus with all the disinfection practices and cooking foods properly, proper temperatures and holding times, um, then in terms of food in the restaurant environment, you shouldn't have to worry too much about the novel coronavirus. But again, it's, it's really more about person to person interaction and then maybe those surfaces like even the, the high touch areas like the um, condiment dispensers, for example. So in all these areas, the pool rails, it's the hotel gyms, the workout equipment, identifying high touch areas and do what we can to disinfect those frequently and properly. And then also preparing for the guest questions. And this is where I'm starting to hear more anecdotal information about conflicts with guests. And in particular, with hotels. And so perhaps it's something, again, I'm not in the hotel industry, as you know, but maybe it's something to think about if someone comes in from out of town. I mean, you're, that's, hotels are more likely to encounter people who come in from out of town who maybe there's different restrictions or um, different type of ordinance in their community. So they're not used to, what, do you want me to wear a mask and or a face covering? And I'm paying for a night, a home away from home, so to speak. I should be able to do what I want to do. Maybe, maybe a hotel will opt to close the gym. The hotel's open, but maybe the gym is just too risky. Well, that guest, you know, then might be asking the front desk person for a discount because the hotel gym should be included in their price. You know, will that front desk person be able to make that decision and, and lower the nightly stay? Now, I don't know how that works, but I just know there's lots of conflicts with hotel gyms and pool areas. And then even those common areas where you have places where um, guests can print their boarding passes and the keyboards and, and the computer areas. We have to be very careful about when we allow access, we need to be careful that we also um, routinely disinfect. So for restaurants, and this is you know within hotel settings, but I, I also included considering easy curbside pickup, maybe to foster more people taking food items to go. Um, this could be in the hotel setting or in a museum setting, a zoo, any place where there's food, again, really think about those high touch areas, maybe remove the tabletop condiment dispensers, have single use packets. Um, I've heard anecdotally customers not liking going to restaurants and seeing employees wearing face coverings, but if you think about aerosolized droplets and the, the fact that um, we know many people could be asymptomatic, I think it's a good idea that employees wear face coverings have online payment options, again, routinely disinfecting those services. So just, just different things to, to think about with the novel coronavirus. Um, some of you may be attending the UT Health School of Public Health. We're having weekly webinars 
for specific industries and they let me know if you like the, the link to those. They're on Wednesdays. They start at 1030 El Paso time. They run for about 90 minutes. And last week we had one re on restaurants and I, I made a comment that I didn't plan to say. It just, it came out um, and I hope it wasn't detrimental to restaurants opening, but we talked about this notion of wearing face coverings, okay, with, with employees and um, customers. And I think one of the overarching comments from one of the experts on the panel was that customers would be ideal if they, when they entered the establishment, they wore a face covering, but obviously they need to remove it when they eat. And so then we have the issue with spacing tables and limiting chairs at tables to maintain as much distancing as possible. And the comment was raised that it's very difficult to do that in many restaurants with tables and, and chairs and you can't distance people six feet apart at the same table. And so the comment I made was, you know, maybe this is really a customer responsibility and thinking about, yes, we want to support the economy. We want to support restaurants. And I miss, I had, I had missed going to a restaurant. Maybe it's more about going to restaurants with their family who we'd be sitting with at a kitchen table anyways. And maybe right now, this is what I said, maybe restaurants aren't the place for the social gathering just yet. Maybe if I miss one of my friends, we could go for a walk in the park wearing our face coverings. Maybe that would be less risky than meeting at a restaurant where we're gonna sit at the same table and have to take off the face covering. At least as we're getting through this transition of the pandemic. But definitely wanna get back to restaurants, use that curbside pickup or take the family, again, whom you would be dining with anyways. Gyms, I'm, I'm, in this case, I was really thinking about the hotel gyms considering this talk. But I wanted to mention a couple of points. Um, that idea of face masking of everyone. I know it's recommended if you're jogging, running, you really shouldn't be wearing a face mask. That could be detrimental to you. Just something though to consider in terms of what the person is doing and, and the establishment. As I mentioned before, maybe limiting the gym capacity, keeping track of who's using the gym when, maybe Maybe different occupants sign up for a time during this time. Um, so schedule the workout appointments, encourage virtual training sessions as more for the commercial gym. And then finally, um, just a point of consideration that I've been kind of surprised about is the disinfection of surfaces. And I, I can't think of places that would have much more high touch surfaces than a gym where they're shared equipment. And the recommendations I have seen from various sources have recommended that it should be the responsibility of the person who just worked out, who I'm thinking probably gonna be very sweaty and tired. It's their responsibility to clean the equipment that they just used when they're finished. And then the person entering the gym, it's up to them to decide if they wanna clean it before they use it. And apparently lots of gyms are having patrons sign waivers um, of liability. And I guess before Jim started to reopen, I was thinking it would be, I don't know how they would do this, but it would be something that the gym owner, the manager, the employees would really engage in the disinfection of the equipment between uses. That, that's what I was foreseeing, but that's not what I'm seeing in guidelines. And that's not what I'm seeing, um, not necessarily El Paso, I'm not talking about El Paso, but others at some of our other campuses, Austin, San Antonio, They've sent me, oh, I joined, I, have, I belong to a gym and this is what we're supposed to do. And I am surprised by this. I'm also surprised that on different documents, ranking as public establishments and, and workplaces that gyms are only listed at medium risk. I just think for the, maybe, maybe it's because it's mostly people engaging with surfaces and they are trying to control those classes where people would be together. But I just think gyms are very risky and they pose a higher level of risk of infection for the novel coronavirus than some of these other venues. So let's take this one, for example, water-related activities. I was asked to give um, a brief talk on, before Memorial Day weekend, on beaches. Okay, what's gonna be the risk of people now going to beaches? And as I mentioned before, it's, it's just like um, what I mentioned about the pools. It's more about keeping social distancing so whether we're talking about a water park or a beach, I have a picture here of a water park, is maintaining social distancing, which could be hard. We also consider those places somewhat of a relaxed atmosphere. Sometimes people are drinking. It could be very difficult to follow you know, the, the proper protocol, social distancing. And then can you imagine wearing face coverings and the suntan you might get if you're out 
out at the water park, so people may not be likely to wear those. Um, there has been no documented waterborne transmission of the novel coronavirus. But what's interesting about it is what we know now out of China, since they were earlier on in the pandemic, their CDC has reported studies of patients who tested positive for this coronavirus has excreted viral particles in their feces. And we don't always see that with respiratory viruses. So this is significant because now we're finding it in wastewater. So there is the potential um, that maybe there could be a fecal oral transmission. But when we think about the chances of, of through recreational play in water, contracting the novel coronavirus, it's very, very small when we consider the water source and then water treatment, okay? So we know that even though this is a novel coronavirus, it's structured in a similar way as to the other coronaviruses that have been better studied. Those particular coronaviruses are highly susceptible to disinfection through water treatment and, and also what we talked about with the disinfectants we might use on a tabletop. So we know that if we have a chlorinated pool, we shouldn't be all that worried about an asymptomatic person who might be shedding viral particles in the pool if the water is chlorinated. We also know that the other coronaviruses that are better studied do not survive well in salt water. So I had a lot of questions about what if it's a windy day and someone's on the beach or even at a pool and there's aerosolized droplets, the risk should still be very small. I don't wanna give a false sense of security about sun. I put that on there. We know that the novel coronavirus is highly susceptible to UV treatment. So it's theoretically possible. We keep hearing about this in the media that, oh, when the summer months come, our risk will be lower or I'm outside, so I'm safe, I'm in the sun. I mean, I don't wanna base my health on theory, but um, we know that sunlight does, does have a role in, in activating this virus. So probably the riskiest behavior besides maintaining social distancing and if that becomes problematic um, would be those who may choose to recreate in surface water such as a lake that are not disinfected. So then there is a potential. I still would recommend that the, or suggest that the risk of infection to people recreating at a lake would be low and it's more about maintaining social distancing. But what we know about shedding patterns of COVID-19 positive patients that there is that potential if folks are recreating in a lake that does not use dis does not have disinfection, um, there could be the risk of waterborne transmission, but this has never been documented. And then finally, this is yeah, my last slide on museums, zoos, and parks. A lot of the guidelines you'll look up, and one of the sources I have will list a lot of the attractions, special attractions, and some of them are the same, even if it's indoors versus outdoors. So it's a lot of push to remote ticketing options to avoid that interaction as you're entering a, a park. Use signage, visible signage, reminding people, whether it's face coverings or hand washing, or you know, maintaining six feet separation. Some, I saw some schemes of, of zoos and parks, for example, maybe blocking off picnic areas, places where we really don't want people to congregate. Um, we want them to walk through the zoo and see the animals, but perhaps maybe not plan to come and bring lunch and sit. Make hand sanitizer available where possible. Be sure the restrooms are in working order. That's the case with restaurants and other places. And then identifying those high touch areas that you can disinfect. So I chose this picture because, you know, here again, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun attraction and it can be hard to keep people apart. Um, but I think with signage and, and um, you know, in this case it's children, you know, parents, it is possible to enjoy a zoo outside and enjoy a museum that's indoors. And just really thinking about maintaining distance and avoiding those high touch areas. And then finally, this will be some of the lists that'll be provided for you. And I've included the American Hotel and Lodging Association as well as that as affiliated with Texas. And then the Texas Department of State Health Services, that particular site there does have um, quite a variety of different workplace establishments and I say, you know, hospitality attractions listed with some of them are the same guidelines, but some have a couple of different nuances that you might find helpful. So with that, I'll stop and I welcome any questions. I'm gonna try just to get out of this mode so I can see.
That's great, Dr. Mennett. Thank you so much for that. Um, and honestly, for myself, I can't speak for the rest of the group. There were uh, a lot of myths that you were able to dispel, um, one being water safety. So I'm glad you spent um, some time on there. I know a couple of our hotels that are represented here have uh, extensive pools or even a water slide. So I'm sure that they found that information helpful. One of the questions that came up during your um, your talk was, should there be concern uh, over employees wearing their masks for a long periods or extended periods of time? Maybe in terms of, of them, like respiratory or maybe even, yeah, there's, there's two things and there could be depending upon what they do. Definitely. And we, we had this, the webinar series I mentioned, we got a lot of questions related to that for the construction industry. You know, people outside at a job site in the heat and wearing a mask. So that's definitely something that needs to be self-monitored and would be tailored for that, that workplace. The other issue, just like I've done here, I mean, I wore this mask here because I did come into the office. There's no one else here but me. And I, except the security guard downstairs, <laughs> but I did wear this. But then, you know, then I just tossed it right, you know, on, on the desktop. And so thinking about wearing it for a long period of time and maybe not the cloth one, it probably should be, well, it should be washed at least daily if that was part of that question with soap and water. Again, this, the nice, the nice thing about this novel coronavirus is that it's not really easy to get rid of. Unlike norovirus. I mean, if you, if you have the disinfectants, which I know can be hard to come by and you, you wash the face coverings, it's not a hardy organism. It's just, it's just a, a pest right now and scary because of what we don't know about it and how easily it's transmitted. And what about just um, as far as oxygen intake or, or being able to breathe easily, say, you know, my shift is eight hours or four hours and I get my break, but wearing that the entire time, do you see any issues there? I, I do. I mean, I'm not an MD on the, on the panel of experts I talked about. We do have an MD pulmonologist on that on those Wednesdays and that's something I'll look into more since I have this question. I know I, I struggle sometimes with that so I think depending even if I was just standing somewhere maybe not even talking that much I think it would become cumbersome so probably depends on the person I would take breaks from it. I would just be mindful when you're around people maybe when you're around your environment maybe think more about hand washing and disinfecting the area. Cause I, I do see that could become cumbersome. And, and that also, I just want to mention briefly, it reminds me of cars. And also maybe you see, I see a lot of jokes, people joking, you don't need your mask in the car. <laughs> and when we think about person to person, and I know that people who have to drive a vehicle for work, their coworker, I see them wearing masks. And I know that some establishments require that. Now, if you're with someone from your household, then you probably don't need to. But what I will say is, there's not been a lot done regarding car hygiene. So again, we need to think about this. If you're asymptomatic and you're not wearing a mask in the car, I, I'm bringing this up because I plan to take my mask off in the car one time and I, I wasn't, I just didn't. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I did have a little bit of trouble. It was hot and I, you know, it was hard to breathe. I always had my mask on and it made me really think, should I have my mask on? There has been a study recently, and it was in the, the pop media, but they were showing the different places in the car where you can, even though it's in the hot sun, you can um, detect certain viruses and other pathogens in the car setting. So there's no perfect solution, but it's just something for us to think about. And I think back to that question, it's going to have to depend on the person, what their job duties are and what they can handle, because it, it would be difficult to wear the face covering for eight hours straight, or even, even I think 40 minutes straight. Darn, I thought, you know, the 109 degree temperatures we were going to see later this week might do us a favor, but, <laughs> um, you know, uh, something that came up also um, during our hour together. Um, recently, I ventured out and um, it's very rare. I have been really uh, in lockdown mode since um, mid-March, um, but I did venture out a whole two times and I was shocked to see that both establishments didn't have hand sanitizer gel readily available. And they were handing me pens to sign. Um, and I found that interesting because that was on my mind. And then I thought, well, I need to take my, my own uh, precautions and carry my own. But um, I think that there is some sort of level of comfort when I walk in and I see some sort of gel available. That means not only is that available to me, but it's been available to the people that have um, uh, come in before me. And so that, that gives me some comfort. But I would encourage 
you know, our hotel partners um, to make that readily available. I mean, you do run the risk of it getting swiped off the counter, um, but it just wasn't a the two establishments I went into. Right, it makes me realize and if they're thinking about that, they're probably thinking about other safeguards as well. And so, so you know, I like that too. I don't see any other questions. Now, folks, now is your time. We've got a few more minutes before we wrap up. Um, and so feel free to take advantage of, of us having uh, Dr. Mena and her expertise in this area. And if anyone would like to bring up something that I didn't mention, you know, I'm, I'm working on different safeguards for the state and I'd like, you know, be informed, especially as we work on, should there be a return to work testing strategy for the virus? Should it be for antibodies? We don't have great tests. So that's what also makes it difficult. But um, just even your question about wearing a mask for long periods of time, I've never heard that addressed, but it's, it's an obvious concern now that, that it's been brought up as we return to work. Um, and so if anyone has any comments, if not now, then later, I welcome conversations. It would help me um, understand how to address the pandemic better. That's great. Well, I don't see any more coming through, but uh, we will take you up on your offer to answer questions uh, later, should they come in from our partners here. Um, actually, we do have another question from Ms. Michelle. Um, would plexiglass work uh, better or uh, worse, or should it be done in conjunction with masks? That's a good question, because now that I'm thinking about the other question about wearing masks for long periods of time, I could see, I'm not sure how well this would work, so you all can inform me, but maybe, um, maybe in the setting, like the hotel setting, like what we see at the cash registers at grocery stores, they're not all wearing masks, but they have the plexiglass and, the, and some of the other retails the plexiglass does provide a, a barrier. Um, we've had a lot of questions regarding that though, in terms of, okay, how often should those be clean? We're not touching the plexiglass we're and we're touching the pen pads and, and there's somewhat of a controversy over the pen pads and cleaning them between customers because you're not getting that contact time with a disinfectant and some stores are better than others with, about having someone standing there to do that. But I think the plexiglass could be a nice solution to um, give someone a break from wearing the face covering. I mean, we have as many barriers as possible, but I think it's gonna need to be tailored to the particular workplace. So yeah, definitely plexiglass, just you just want that barrier between people. That's great. Great question, Michelle. I think that will wrap it up. We thank you so much for your time and uh, the information you provided us. And um, we definitely like to have you back, um, you know, based on some of these other uh, panels that you're sitting on or hosting yourself, um, maybe have you back in a few weeks to talk about some new findings or some new information. Okay, thank you. That, that I really appreciate it. And, and, and those of you who are in the water area or water, water parks, you know, we are, Going to be implementing in El Paso a wastewater surveillance um, where we look at wastewater based epidemiology and see what people are excreting in their stools who may be asymptomatic what's coming into our wastewater plants as an early warning tool for public health because we know that if you become infected you will shed the virus as early as three to four days after infection as opposed to one to two weeks when the your symptoms will become severe enough to seek medical treatment and get a test. And so we're starting that. There's a handful of communities around the world and El Paso is gonna start doing that. So, um, and that'll also tell us more about its what potential for waterborne transmission and how it relates to water activities too. So thank, thank you for having me. I always learn so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much. And thank you all for participating. Uh, recordings and Dr. Menace Life will be available. So just reach out if you're interested in either. Thank you all.